I got a first hand experience in all the, 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 the friction and the burden that for regular citizens is just to obtain legal papers birth certificates, marriage certificates, death certificates. For example, send, I have my great grandmother born in Italy, my grandmother born in Uruguay, and myself born here. And being forced to deal with all that documentation demanded me over a year uh, where you need to get this certification, these third party approvals and, and signatures that basically in a digital world make no sense whatsoever. I met Diego Fernandez, Buenos Aires Secretary of Innovation at ETH Denver, where I interviewed him on stage about the way he's approaching digital identity in Buenos Aires. Last year, Buenos Aires released a blockchain identity solution powered by ZK Sync's ZK Proofs. Now, this allows citizens of Buenos Aires to store their birth and marriage certificates on chain. A little bit of the technical stuff here. The program is based on a decentralized digital identity protocol known as Quark ID and relies partly on a technology from a company called Extremium. So how does this work? Well, citizens of Buenos Aires can download the wallet and claim their key personal identification documents like birth certificates and marriage certificates. Now, if you've never had to retrieve one of these documents from a government agency, you probably think that this is a novel idea. But I recently had to get my birth certificate, and let me tell you, it is a long and annoying process. Imagine that these documents could be stored on chain forever, easily accessible to you no matter how many times you move or how many devices you lose. This is the future that Diego imagines. He describes a scenario where someone might be able to enter a bar when they turn of age. In the future, he imagines you don't need to actually show the bouncer of that bar your address or birth date. All you need to do is prove that you are of age to enter that bar. And using zero knowledge proofs, you can do just that while protecting your personal information. Diego hopes that Buenos Aires can realize this future. And he tells me that the digital identity protocol is being integrated with the already existing central ID system there to bring 3 million people, the people who live in Buenos Aires, on chain. He wants to make the process so seamless that the people who are using this app have no idea about what's going on with the technology behind it. This makes total sense to me. When I send an email, I don't care about the technology behind that. And when I open up Google Maps, I don't care how it works. I just want it to work. Could projects like this help accelerate mainstream adoption? Let's take a listen. Diego Fernandez, welcome to First Mover. Hi, Jen. Pleasure being here. Diego, talk to me about the work that you're doing with digital identity in Buenos Aires. Well, we have been working for the last two years in Buenos Aires with a bunch of these members of the crypto community in Argentina and worldwide, because we received strong support from several organizations worldwide, just to mention a few, CK Sync, also Model Lab, CK Sync, et cetera. And we develop a, a self-sovereign identity protocol based on the international W3C standards, that being digital identity, digital identifier, sorry, and verified credentials, following the technology stack laid out by the Trust Over IP Foundation. And uh, we developed this protocol. It took us something like two years to come up with this. And we open source the protocol. Everybody can, can download it from GitHub. Uh, you can go to quarkid.org. You can fork it, use it. Uh, it's, it's based under the Apache 2.0 license, so everybody can use it. And we encourage every government, private company, organization to take advantage of the, the technology because it's great. You're the Secretary of Innovation, so it's no surprise that you're looking in to what kinds of technologies can help advance Buenos Aires. But talk to me about how the conversation around digital identity really started to become important for you uh, as a government official. To be completely honest, I got involved in the digital identity realm something like four years ago uh, because of a personal experience of mine. Uh, I am Argentine, I'm born and raised here, but I wanted to, to get the advantage because of my great, great grandmother was an Italian to get the Italian passport. But mainly thinking about my daughters, but I, I mean, I got myself into that uh, project. And I got a first-hand experience in all the, 
the, the friction and the burden that for regular citizens is just to obtain legal papers, birth certificates, marriage certificates, death certificates. And how do you deal with overseas when you need to, for example, send, I have my great grandmother born in Italy, my grandmother born in Uruguay, my father born in, in, in the province of Buenos Aires in Argentina, and myself born here. And being forced to deal with all that documentation demanded me over a year uh, where you need to get this certification, these third party approvals and, and signatures that basically in a digital work make no sense whatsoever. And what's the reason behind that? Because we don't have, or we didn't have yet a primary, a primitive, sorry, for digital identity. And fortunately that is something that is being built all around the world. Today you have the DIAC in, in Canada, the ADAS in, in Europe, the Sync Pass in Singapore, the Alliance in South Korea, Quark ID in Buenos Aires and several other places in the region. And the main objective behind all of these initiatives is to get society rid of the friction that dealing with legal documentation demands. I mean, how do we build up a digital trust framework in which we can assure that the document that Jen signed and gave on my behalf or, or gave it to me is, a, is destined to myself and it's officially signed by Jennifer? And how do we are able of ensuring, regardless of third party involvement, that that is true? And that would be a game changer. That would be a, a game changer, in my humble opinion, as strong as the appearance of internet communications, email, and so on, and so on the, the, created in the 2000s, in the early 2000s. It will be a complete game changer. Diego, I got to ask first before we move on, did you get the Italian passport? <laughs> I'm in the process. I think that in July I'll get it. My fingers are crossed for you. And I totally understand this process because I recently had to apply for a birth certificate um, from Canada. I'm Canadian. And it's just not as easy as it should be. It's very difficult. Uh, and something that came up in the conversation that you and I had at ETH Denver was it's kind of crazy that a way to verify a document online is to take a picture of the physical copy you have and upload it onto the Internet. Just it's it really is not making sense. It doesn't. Uh, and the crazy thing is that today we have everything in our lives digitalized. I mean, okay, people writing in pieces of paper, in general, those type of notes get back to whatever digital medium that you have. I mean, I don't know, your doc slides, whatever. But we, we are not able of interpreting that data in able to operate with the other party. So we need humans reading documents and just trusting that, I mean, the, the whatever paper that you send me is original. The thing is that when you have to deal with sort of these important transactions of, hey, I'm going to give you the, citizen, the citizenship of my country. Hence, I need to be sure that you, your documentation is real. When you need to be sure about something and you don't have a digital trust framework, you rely on the analog frameworks, which are very, very troublesome. And then you, you're faced with the type of things that like you face when you were dealing with your birth certificate or that, that I faced when I was dealing with my, the birth certificates of my ancestors. It's really troublesome. All right, let's talk a little bit about the technology here. Um, the existing protocol, Quark ID, is using zero knowledge, right? Uh, why zero knowledge? Why are you working with ZK Sync? What kind of process did you go through to figuring out what kind of technology could help make this um, experience better for the people of Buenos Aires? It's a very good question. Well, the first thing was we needed something that was completely scalable. We needed something that was able of dealing with uh, thousands of transactions per second. And it was cheap because these, these are not financial transactions. We're not charging an X amount of, uh, I don't know, Y amount of dollars being transferred or, what, or whatsoever. These transactions are basically social and granting you a credential is to your driver license or your birth certificate or your marriage certificate. So we need to, the cost be extremely cheap, extremely cheap. I mean, talking about, I mean, I mean 
even less than a cent. And we need it for that transactions to be extremely sure on the extremely safe, sorry, in the second hand. And on the third hand, we were looking forward to a model in which an ecosystem of private parties was built around this technology. We didn't want it to be a, a state permission that own network because there's no value for us in that. We wanted to build an ecosystem of, of players and, and actors interacting with this technology in order to provide value to society. So we opted for zero knowledge proof because Quark ID, as a matter of fact, acts as a sort of a layer three. We have Quark ID, we have CK Sync as a layer two, and we have the security of Ethereum as a layer one. And what this allows us is to sort of batch transactions together. So we can do a whole bunch of transactions then we plug it in a zero knowledge proof and we anchor that in blockchain. And we have the complete security of a layer one Ethereum, but being able to optimize the, the, the costs by using zero knowledge proof. That on the first hand side. On the second hand side, zero knowledge proofs allow us to uh, do the selective disclosure. That is, you don't need to reveal the whole part of your credential if you for example are 19 years old and you, and you need to go to a bar to have a beer you don't need to show the bartender your right your address or your birth date or whatever information the bartender doesn't need the only thing that he or she needs to prove is that you are plus 18 in argentina the law is plus 18. so if you if you're able to hand out that proof that you effectively are plus 18 that's the only information the given bartender needs in order to provide you with the beer that you want. So selective, uh, sorry, zero knowledge proofs allows us to, to achieve that as well. And we selected our uh, CK thing, the model lab, because the, they were really helpful. Our teams worked together for one year plus uh, with day-to-day -day conversations regarding how to implement this technology. And we're extremely happy with it. Why? Because just to, to give you an idea of how this protocol works, the only thing that get on chain, because it's, this is extremely important, the only thing that gets on chain is your digital identifier, which has no information whatsoever regarding yourself. All of the transactions that you that you do implement uh, minting verified credentials are done off chains or a peer-to-peer -peer relationship. And that is extremely safe because you can have all your information on the chain and nobody's able of taxing you, but you have the security that your identifiers are on chain, hence nobody's able to tamper them. Now, you told me recently that the digital identity protocol is being integrated into the centralized ID system, and this could potentially bring 3 million people, that's the population of Buenos Aires on chain. How's this going to work for citizens? Say I'm living in Buenos Aires, how does this work for me? Do I even know that this is happening? Well, ideally you shouldn't. I mean, technology is for us nerds and geeks that love to know how things work and so on, but I mean, just to give an example, I have no seen, I have not a clue on how my car works. I just get onto a car and I press a button Hope and the it car drives. starts. Yeah. <laughs> and if somebody, if the car doesn't start, I mean, I don't know what to do because I don't like cars. I mean, I'm not interested in the, in the technology behind cars, but there are certain people that love cars and most probably know what buttons to press and what things to do. The same thing happens in technology. There are some of us who love technology and who like to understand what things happen sort of under the hood. But regular users shouldn't. I mean, I always give this analogy that when I started working in technology, something like 30 years ago, the email was starting to be rolled out and configuring an email was an extremely technical stuff. You need to put MX records in your DNS servers and configure a POP3 or SMTP or IMAP or whatever. You need to have some technical knowledge. But while that type of knowledge was required, email was not popular. Email became popular when solutions as, for example, Gmail started and, and wrote, took the place by storm because it was extremely easy just with a wizard. You get on, you get an email account and you were able of, of using it. We're using the same thing here. We have today 7 million registered users within the centralized ID systems in Buenos Aires, 3 million active users 
and 1 million users with a biometric scan. We, as a security measure, require users to have this level three, this 1 million users that will already have biometric. And when, you conf when we confirm that you are you, because we did this biometric checkup, we mean you your birth certificate and whatever documents. What we are doing is we have these web two applications, which is called MIBA, which is stands for My Buenos Aires. And what we will do is essentially is, is instead of having a central database where we hold all of the credentials and you download the and you download those credentials when you open your applications, we're gonna replace that centralized web two technology with Quark ID in July, August uh, this year. So for users, it will be something as simple as having an update on their applications and having their credentials minted. They will be, it will be pretty transparent. But they will start to see some advantages when they are able of checking certain information with a QR code or eventually integrating, as we are right now, several private users or private companies which are starting to meet the, their credentials using Quark ID technology. So basically, once that happens, I could go to a bar, maybe with a QR code or some other kind of identifier, they could scan that. I don't need to show my ID, so they don't need to know my address <laughs> or, or my name, <laughs> um, and I would be able to get in. That's, that's kind of what we're hoping to happen. That is the idea. Of course, I mean, in every big technological project, when you're sort of targeting millions of users, by far the most complex stage is implementation, adoption, and that takes time. I mean, that is much more slower and, and painful than developing the technology. The technology is developed, and I think that we will need something like two to three years in order to gain mass adoption in Buenos Aires and in the region, because we're working with several other provinces in, in Argentina, which are as well taking that, this technology and, and, and using it. But I'm pretty confident that in the next two to three years, we will start to see uh, a shift. These are very big organizations. Society as a whole takes time in order to move from one thing to another. But once this type of solutions of technology st start to gain sort of a <clears throat> expanded over certain regions, that, could, that growth rate accelerates pretty fast. You know, when we think about governments, or when I think about governments, I should say, I shouldn't generalize, um, I think about very slow moving um, processes, processes that are hard to change, processes that have been in place for a very, very long time. Uh, did you get complete buy-in from your colleagues when you were implementing this? I know now you're talking about other provinces that are looking into using the same technology. Are, are you seeing a shift in the way that government embraces innovation or is it still a little bit of a fight for you? I mean, it's always a fight, uh, to be honest, because as you said, I mean, governments are by definition bureaucratic. Uh, that, I mean, it, it's kind of logical. Now we don't want governments that move like startups because then <laughs> our reality would shift uh, dramatically. But uh, what I think is that today, uh, and the bull market helps in that direction, uh, if I would say, what are the two most sort of uh, sexy technologies around? Well, I would say AI and blockchain. And, and everybody who's in the, in, the, in the innovation arena and, and looking at what are what is happening around the world. Well, blockchain and AI are sort of the two main things that you need to be looking at. If you're not looking at blockchain and AI, something's happening to you. And uh, I guess the being, although this self-sovereign identity arena is kind of a very abstract and complex, as it relies on blockchain, it raises eyebrows. It was like, hey, mm, I want to know how that works. Mm, I'm interested. And that on one side. On the, on the other side, what government officials, and, and, and I need to give credit to, to the government of Estonia, Denmark, Finland, uh, in that, in that direction is everybody who's today in, in the public sector knows that the great problem that we have is not digitalization, but interoperability. Today we have these silos within governments and within organizations that 
do not allow us, do not allow us to effectively interchange and interoperate the information. So we all know that that's the most big pain that we are dealing with. And this type of technologies, like work ID, verified credentials, allows us to do a very effective and cheap interoperability for governments and for companies. You described that so well. I, I, and anyone who's had to interact with any kind of uh, government agency, I think, knows that often it seems like they don't speak to each other. It's hard to get documentation from one government agency to another. And so I, what you're saying makes complete sense. This could this could really solve that and make, make it easier for people who need to interact with their governments. Well, it's terrible. I mean, regardless of the country, of the city, how many times we are doing whatever thing in a government website and the government requests us to upload a PDF document that comes from another government agency. That is crazy. Uh, but I mean, we're dealing with that type of things every day in our lives. And that is what we need to get rid of because both systems are digital, but they don't speak to each other. And if we, if we are sort of hoping that all of the government agencies and all of the private companies build APIs or microservices or whatever backend interfaces, that's not, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. We don't have time for that. It will take us decades. Uh, hence, this way of interoperating with a standard on the front end, for me, is, is, is the way to go. And Diego, the last thing I'm going to ask you is, if you were to look into your crystal ball, what does the future look like for you when it comes to zero knowledge? And if I were to expand that out a little bit, I guess, you know, what does, what does the world look like? What, where else might we see zero knowledge technology? Where else might we see zero knowledge implemented? I think that we will see zero knowledge implemented pretty much everywhere because uh, in this new 100% digitalized world, our private information is at risk. Uh, and we are becoming every day more conscious about that. I mean, all of us use whichever password or, or login aggregator, such as Google, Apple, or whatever, and we're putting in the hands of private companies the our digital selves. And that is crazy. If I lose that, if I lose access to my Google account, I will get sort of banned in 90% of the digital assets that I use in my everyday life. And I think that power should be given back to users. Users should be able of holding and having their own identity, regardless of governments or private companies or whatever. And uh, I think that zero knowledge proof plays a, a, a very big role in that because we won't be so easily sending out photos of our passports, photos of our driver's license to whatever organizations need to know that we are we. we. We are in the challenge of demonstrating in a digitally provable manner that we are we without giving information. And zero knowledge proof is the name of the game. 